Uh, we're happy to start the uh, last two talks of the afternoon of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, first talk is by Alexander Westphal, who's going to tell us about pensters in the landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here in beautiful Cambridge and speak here for uh, being able to participate in the conference. So I'm going to talk about something that is to some extent still speculative. You can judge for yourself. Hopefully at the end I tr will try to make an attempt uh, to explain that maybe we can start to estimate the distribution of tensor modes over at least regions of the landscape. Let's put it like this. So I have to <coughs> qualify a little bit. Um, so, and yeah. So you, as you know, of course, we have live now in this age of uh, precision cosmology. We have some evidence for the uh, for in inflation in the past, in the f and not not yet maybe unique evidence, but in the sense of the um, the observation of a near scale invariant power spectrum of density perturbations in the very early universe prior to decoupling, and. Uh, Based on that, basically, we should maybe be able to start to classify uh, inflation models across the landscape of string theory. And there are basically like um, uh, the, the simplest models of inflation, they have just two parameters. They have the spectral index of the power spectrum of density perturbations, and they have the amount of gravitational waves that they produce, measured by the fraction and power and tensor modes R. So and the point is that um, this power uh, of tensor modes is directly related to the scale of inflation. So if you ask about the distribution of the value r of, uh, of the fraction of tensor modes, then you ask in the end, to some degree at least, about the distribution of the scale of inflation, modulo some loopholes that you already, I mean, but, uh, and um, that means you ask about, in a sense, the to, to, uh, for the distribution of an effective cosmological constant, which is large, which is not small like today, large compared to today, but still small compared to the string or Planck scale, because Kobe normalized inflationary models have, co have cosmological constants which are less than 10 to the minus 10 in Planck units. And then you ask, have to ask about how they get populated, how they, how they are distributed. Maybe this can be done, and I will try to give you some arguments why this is not maybe completely hopeless. So uh, for this purpose, I have to make some assumptions that for some regions of the landscape where we have some access seem to be satisfied, and that I basically propose to take them uh, basically satisfied because they are pretty general to, uh, to hold across the whole landscape. And then we will see how far we go can go from there and at which point we have to specify to certain regions. So one of the assumptions is that uh, basically that at the moment I, uh, I want large tensor modes, typically I need a large uh, field uh, excursion of the inflaton field. I need basically a trans Planckian field displacement during inflation. And in order to do so, I have to control arbitrary uh, numbers of dimension 6 and, hi and even higher dimension operators. And for that, I need basically a symmetry. I cannot, I mean, it's basically a functional fine tune. I cannot fine tune away an infinite number of operators unless I have a, shif a symmetry that forbids them. And the symmetry that is so far uh, basically has been shown that can do that. Uh, it maybe it's not the only candidate. I mean, then this assumption would basically have to be modified. But so far, we know that the shift symmetry can do that. It can basically protect the inflaton field from getting too uh, worrisome radiative corrections and higher dimension operators that screw up the large field regime. So, but then you have to contrast this with uh, the other fact that we seem to so far to have found in, in, in string theory compactifications to four dimensions that the field range of every possible candidate that has a good shift symmetry, typically an axial field, is limited. And it actually, typically, the fundamental domain is limited to less than the Planck distance. So if you were just to stop here, then you would say there is no large field inflation, right? So this comes basically from the fact that, uh, as I said, already said, all those fields that have good shift symmetries, they tend to be uh, have some periodicity, some fundamental uh, domain that's limited. Typically, they are axions, or they could be, for instance, also angles between brains. And when you canonically normalize them, you find that their field range is always suppressed by the size of the compact manifold. And that always gives you, in the end, that the field range is less than Planckian. So then in addition, uh, there will be 
the structure that you that was already in part discussed about the landscape of, of metastable vacuo, uh, the zeta vacuo itself. So there are two basic basic facts that, that that I will be using. One is that the the mechanism that so far we know how to jump between different zeta vacuo is tunneling, mainly Coleman de Lucia tunneling. This is the um, the only way how we know how to how to get between the vacuo, and I have to discuss how they get populated if I want to make any estimate. And then. The basic structure so far that we seem to find is that, uh, at least in certain regions of the landscape, there seem to be exponentially many vacua in a very high dimensional uh, mo moduli space. And uh, if you look at the Zeta vacua among them, you take any Zeta vacuum with a reasonably small cosmological constant, and you go in moduli space to the next neighboring vacua, you typically find a large jump in vacuum energy. <coughs> you don't get something like a, a tiny increasing washboard. Uh, but you get something that when you look up from your local vacuum, um, it, it goes very high. So all the neighboring, basically, typically neighboring vacuum have, have, have large CC compared to the to, to scales of the CC, like 10 to the minus 10 or even smaller, that are therefore, you know, <coughs> the inflation describing our universe or even our late time cosmological constant. And that's something that you have to factor in. And then, of course, once you talk about that you have these m many desita vacuum, uh, where part of the space-time can reside and in, in, uh, inflate before even tunneling to other vacua, you have to talk about how to regulate the infinities coming from an internal phase of inflation that happens in these false vacua. Uh, this measure question is ambiguous. There are different measures that uh, sometimes predict different results. There is no a priori candidate for a measure yet that is derived from the fundamental theory. So the point here is that if I will find that whatever comes out is dependent on the choice of measure, let's say by an exponential <laughs> sensitivity, then I'm done. I can't do anything anymore because then we just don't know anything. The point will be that what we find is that, unfortunately, the purpose that I'm trying to analyze will not depend exponentially on the choice of measure. It's basically invariant. Regardless which measure I choose, I get the same qualitative answer. And that's, what I that, that, that's the only reason why I can proceed. So then. Uh, the consequences of basically of the points one and two I made, that you basically, uh, you need a large field range if you want to produce uh, uh, tensor modes with uh, single field models, uh, and uh, that those sh fields with a good shift symmetry ha have a restricted field range on the fundamental domain on, uh, um, on their own, that basically, I mean, you have basically two possibilities to parametrically avoid that. There are some fields, there is for instance the overall volume, which can to some degree have an extended field range. Uh, so for instance, the, the high fiber inflation models, they give you something like four or five Planck units and therefore basically scratch the boundary of detectable gravity waves. The point is that because they don't, the, 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 the large vo the volume has, doesn't have a, a shift symmetry per se, a good shift symmetry, it doesn't get parametric protection. So I'm asking here about basically parametric statements. Therefore, I will have to use axion fields and the axon fields, there are only two, two ways so far that we know how to give them a, a parametric large field range. One is you have a large number of them and have, to, uh, and have them acting in unison. Then you get basically an increased field displacement, uh, effective field displacement, and that may give rise to what, you call what, the, what was called inflation. So far, this uh, doesn't have a full string embedding. There was made considerable progress by Thomas Grimm in the past, but this is not yet, I mean, it's, it's open whether you can really embed this. And the other possibility, in principle, is, I mean, just from the definition of the word, you want to have, have a field that has a finite field range, or is periodic even, and you want to give it a potential energy that doesn't see the periodicity. So you have to have some effect that generates monodromy in the potential energy. Uh, there are <coughs> examples that have been found that used uh, the energy of five brains, uh, and um, uh, in walk throats, they will, they will generate a linear potential for a two-form axion. Um, and uh, that will provide, for instance, an example for, 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 a, for a large field model that has like 10 or 11 Planck units for displacement for 60 E folds and may, uh, up to the, to the bounds of stability, give you even like a, a few Planck units more like 20, 30 maybe or something like that. But in general, here I don't care what the source of the monodromy is. I'm just saying that because all the, field, all the fields have a limited field range, a any large field model that deals with a single field will have to have some effect of monodromy. Otherwise, it doesn't give you the large field range. And these are just uh, some examples that, this can, that these uh, sources for such monotomy exist. So this is basically what I said that, I mean, 
based on these constraints on the field range, you need some form of monotony if you want to do large field. Uh, and that basically, and you need to use axions because only those ones are the fields that have a sufficiently well protected shift symmetry or have a chance to have such a shift symmetry. So basically, you are forced to have some form of axion monodromy for a single field, large field model in, in, in string theory, as far as we know. And uh, using that constraint, you can parameterize the effective potential that you get from, from, such, from axion monodromy. There will be the, the, mon the monodromic, if you want potential, the potential that isn't periodic in the axion field, then there will be generically instanton corrections. They are uh, basically like, if you want, uh, dependence on the field when it comes to the minima and maxima of that instanton potential is fixed. Otherwise, it cannot depend on the rest of the moduli. Uh, otherwise, you would have broken the shift symmetry already with this term. But the magnitude of these instanton contributions, that will be a function of the rest of moduli space, right? I mean, in different, different points of moduli space, the, the magnitude of the instantons will be different, typically exponentially dependent on some of the moduli. And then you have the moduli potential for moduli stabilization, which is also there. So um, this is basically the kind of structure when you combine this with the fact that, as I said, that when you go in, in moduli space away from a, from a low CC or relatively low CC region of the potential, a valley or a, or, or a, or a minimum, that you basically go high up. You've the neighbor and the direct neighbor and vacuum and moduli space are t tend to be of high CC then then you find that you know, if you find some inflationary value that supports, let's say, large field, or it could also be a small field region here, some inflection point, right? Then if you go away in moduli space, uh, and this direction chi is summarily denotes all the other moduli. So you should think of this, this is not a, this is a two-dimensional picture. This is deceiving. I mean, this should be like 100 field directions where you can jump away from this point. Then you typically jump up high. And the only structure that the neighboring high CC desitter vacuum will have is that it will have these instanton wiggles in the inflaton direction because there is still the shift symmetry that gives you some structure in that direction. And this will be both true if you describe the eternal inflation happening in these high CC desitter uh, uh, progenitors basically here. If you weight the volume here in some global measure, but it will also be true if you have local measures which basically uh, are devoid of counting the, the, the three volume uh, th uh, growth during an eternal inflation. They basically tell you that, you're, that the, the progenitor of all the population will be some basically uh, some desitter vacuum that is uh, the longest lived. And that means that typically it will not directly tunnel into something else downward, but it will tunnel first upward and then from there downward. But still, these longest lived progenitors are high CC compared to anything that supports observable slow roll inflation or even the late time CC. You will always come from something very high down. That's the basic uh, conclusion you have here. Right? And because of the shift symmetry and the, the breaking from the instanton effects, you see, I mean, that, that may be bigger than in your final inflationary valley, but you see that uh, with respect to the scale of the CC in this, high, in this progenitor vacuum, these wiggles are typically small, and all these vacuum are roughly uh, uh, equal, and it doesn't matter whether you they basically. <coughs> They will populate, they will come from here, and whether you tunnel from here to there or tunnel from here to there, you will find roughly the same, you will find the same initial conditions here. So this is basically, yeah, I mean, it's still a 2D representation. You basically, from the progenitors, which are high scale, you, you populate typically some very high scale vacuum, and from there you can very efficiently tunnel down. You also have this requirement that you have to come on high from high, not only because the typical neighbor neighborhood of any small CC vacuum are high CC vacuum around, but also if you want to efficiently populate an exponentially large number of, some of small CC visitor vacuum to make this entropic argument by Weinberg to work, then you need to efficiently tunnel into them. You can only do this if you come from on high. If you come from something extremely small and tunnel upwards in most of the matter stable other small CC back here, you will never populate enough of them. It is too slow. So, uh, and this you can basically, this asymmetry between tunneling up and tunneling down, you can see from the common de Lucia description of tunneling. You find there that when you tunnel from some low, very low CC to a higher CC desitter, then, uh, and you tunnel into two different higher CC desitters, then tunneling into the higher one is suppressed basically exponentially in the CC of the smaller of the high-lying uh, desitters. Uh, so you get punished for trying to tunnel up high. But if you tunnel downwards, then this is different. Then basically, 
the overall tunneling rate is set by the by by, by the, the, the the overall tunneling rate is set by the by the CC of the high of the high lying desitter vacuum, but the difference be, between in tunneling between from here to something of small CC here and something of a different but still small CC here. So let's say you have two 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 low lying desitter vacuum with vacuum energies V minus and V minus prime. Both are small parametrically compared to the initial desitter vacuum CC, which is V plus. Then the tunneling rate will, bas will, will only uh, uh, basically depend on the change of the target space, of the target vacuum, cosmological constant by a very suppressed effect. And at that moment, because we observable inflationary regions and late time CC, uh, small CC, desitter vacuum, both have parametrically small CC compared to these initial progenitors, which are very high scale. Uh, because that is the case, we do now see that and, and the, the tunneling rate does not depend on the tiny variations of the CC here. We can then basically say, because we have to end up here, I can then average the tunneling rate in coming down from the high CC vacuum over all the, you know, the variant barrier heights that are there in between. And effectively that means that if I compare two low-lying desitter vacuum, V minus and V minus prime of vacuum energy, that the down tunneling rate by which they are fed from the high scale progenitors is will be roughly the same, averaged over all the paths by which you come down from the ICC on all the barriers that are in between. There will be no difference. <coughs> Each different path will, of course, have a different tunneling rate because the barriers will vary from path to path. But because you have so many of these high, uh, of these vacuum where you come down from, the, you will in the end you can average over the barriers. There will be, if you want, some average barrier height, and then you will have basically uh, roughly equal population for all the small CC regions. So, um, if we are at this point, we have then now to ask what happens after you tunnel from some high CC vacuum into some slow roll inflationary region of parametrically smaller CC. What happens after tunneling to the scalar field that is supposed to drive inflation? The point is that if you come out and you have a so called small field model that you could model with an inflection point, for instance, the generic small field models will be some kind of inflection or saddle point and you, you know, you exit at some point in the potential, then typically you overshoot very badly. So unless you would come out here, you would think they will never get populated. You will never hit them. Yeah, <coughs> basically there would be no, no inflation started on, on, on the small field models after you come there by some tunneling event from some high, high CC vacuum. Because typically the high CC vacuum will not exit you here, it will exit you up the <coughs> slope, and then you will be too fast here, you will not go into slow roll and you will overshoot. This was first basically uh, noticed by Bruce and Steinhardt. This is the uh, overshoot problem for uh, both for, 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 for moduli uh, stabilization sometimes quoted and also in for inflationary dynamics. But the point is that inside the bubble that the common Dilochia instanton forms when tunneling down, you have a negatively curved open universe formed. There's negative curvature there. And initially the negative curvature dominates the evolution of the field completely. And if you, what I will show shortly is if you, if you invoke the, 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 the effects of negative curvature, you will find that on, even on such small field models, the negative curvature slows down the field evolution so much that in almost all uh, these models, you get tracked into the inflection point into slow roll. You do not overshoot. And on that, on that note, you, you basically then know that the post-tunneling evolution that naively you would have thought would completely disfavor all the small field <coughs> models actually puts them in the end by virtue of the negative curvature inside the CDL bubble. It puts them on the same footing as the large field models. The initial condition problem there basically is largely relieved. Yeah, I mean, large field models, they, they never have that problem. Even if you come in fast, they will slow down just because they have a large field range to basically slow from the friction of the cosmological constant generated here. Um, So basically, you can. Th this is uh, work that we have done in the past. You can basically model, uh, try to first model such an inflection point potential by uh, writing uh, simple uh, monomials for this steep part of the potential, and then attaching something al almost horizontal. Then you vary the initial height of the point where you get out, and you can then, for certain monomials, you can solve, or at least bound the evolution from some math literature where the, co the corresponding uh, equations of motions have been studied as differential equations. And then you can basically show that you will always come in with such a small speed here that you do not overshoot. 
Yeah? And you can then also go on and combine the, the, uh, several monomials and effectively, thank you, uh, and effectively uh, show that this is true for polynomials and therefore in the end for, for, for general basically uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor, I mean, power series of, uh, that give the potential close to the inflection point. So for instance, for the, for, uh, for the simplest case when the steep part is just a linear potential, a steep linear slope, this was already studied in, uh, in this paper by Freifogel, Kleban, Martinez, and Susskind in 2005. And there was some prior work where some general arguments were already n noted that go in the same direction by Kachu and Duvali in 2003. Where you, there, where you see, and if you come down that linear slope, and then you hit the inflection point, which is modeled by basically something almost horizontal, then uh, you get some finite amount of overshoot. But that ob amount of overshoot depends on the di on the displacement of the field from the inflection point at the point where it exits from tunneling. And if that uh, displacement is small, then you will typically not get the en enough basically rolling that that it will let you overshoot the inflection point. But again, I mean, a linear potential is, of course, a steep linear is a very crude approximation. So you can do this, for instance, for, for, for higher powers, for the for, for quadratic cubic. Here I'm showing a result for a quartic potential that leads into the inflection point. And there you actually find that you come up with zero speed. And for every higher power, too, regardless how high you start, when you start with curvature domination inside the bubble, you will always be tracked into the horizontal part with zero speed. So you will hit slow roll, regardless how narrow the inflection point is for these higher powers. Yeah, and then by, by basically by um, combining uh, this into polynomials, you can show that this is a generic property of most of the potentials leading into inflection points, as long as you have this curvature inside the CDL bubble there. Yeah, so if you combine this, that the post-tunneling evolution dominated by curvature places the removes the initial condition problem for for most of the small field models and places them roughly on the same footing there with large field models, and then that the downward tunneling itself into every small CC region, both uh, you know, uh, observationally viable slow roll inflationary regions, which have parametrically already small CC <coughs> compared to the typical scales, um, and late time the, the, the small CC did have here as well, that you, this tunneling proceeds democratically. And then the, 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 the post-tunneling evolution is democratic, so to speak. Then you find that effectively uh, you have no strong bias, no exponential bias coming for the population of small or large field inflationary models coming from the dynamics that, at least the part of the dynamics we know that happens in, the, in, the, in this eternally inflating digital landscape. So the, the, the prior from the dynamics, even if you account for the different measures, because they all predict you, uh, that they, you have to start on f from coming from a high-lying digital vacuum, otherwise uh, you cannot even efficiently populate enough vacuum to make your anthropic argument for the small present ACC to work. Um, they combine such that there is no strong bias. And then the question of do you expect large field or small field models to dominate, which would answer the question modulo some caveats also about whether you expect large tensor modes or not, is decided by counting. You have to actually now start counting. So. This is something that I, at least personally, didn't expect. I would have thought that the measure completely kills me. That I get some, you know, e to the plus something big or e to the minus something big, for or against the same class, depending on the choice of measure, and then I'm dead with, with, with that question. But this, at least, it doesn't look like you get this strong bias. And then you can again play the same, the same game as with the, with the arguments about the present day cosmology of constant. You can argue the question about R maybe by counting. Counting, we do not know how to do in full generality for the whole landscape, but we know it. We have some, as we heard today already, we have some evidence how to do this for certain regions of the landscape. Yeah. For the small field models, there, is the, there are the random matrix methods that have were reviewed uh, in, in detail in the, in, in the talks by Gary and Liam today, and there will be more talks on them, that basically give you an estimate on uh, the fraction of matter stables in the digital vacuum that you have to take into account and would also allow you to estimate what is the fraction of saddle points in the landscape that have one negative eigenvalue so that the inflation could happen there, but the eigenvalue has to be so small that it's inflationary flat. Thank you. Yeah, you are probably able to, uh, to estimate that question using the random matrix methods, I hope at least. And then if you have that, then you can at least for, uh, let's say, some region of the landscape. Take the, 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 the space of calabi yau manifolds uh, with, uh, with supersymmetric stabilization of a large fraction of the moduli at the high mass scale. 
that, uh, that example that Liam discussed in, in, on this last slide. Then for that case, uh, you know that there are, there's a large number of digita vacua, there will be a large number of saddle points and a certain fraction of them will be flat enough. Th this may be estimated from random matrix theory and uh, you will get some basically some, some number for the, for, for the number of vacua and then some kind of correction factor that tells you how many uh, saddle points you get for the fraction of stable digita vacua. And these have to include, of course, I mean, they have to select it for that they are flat enough to support enough slow roll inflation on, an, on such an inflection point. And then you sum this over the number of Calabial manifolds, which we don't know, but you could estimate this by going to a sample of Calabial manifolds. For instance, in type 2b, you could uh, take uh, the, the kreutzer skarte classification of toric uh, manifolds, uh, uh, Calabials that are constructed via GLSMs on toric ambient spaces. And then you could make a scan, basically, of all those, right? And, uh, and see what happens there. And then for the, so these are basically like the overall number of, of uh, this is how the overall number of metastable is it back here you would, you would get, right? I mean, if you have the like, large number of complex suction moduli fixed at high mass scales by flux, and then a smaller number of kilo moduli, you, you, you go to that region of Calabial space, then you can use these arguments that were shown earlier, and then you can estimate this. This would have to be found still, how many saddle points that are flat enough you get from a random matrix estimate. And for the large field models, the situation looks like you have to, of course, I mean, once I have an axion there and the axion has its shift symmetry and gets some source of monodromy uh, to make its potential energy, then the point is that uh, because of the shift symmetry protection, uh, a large fraction of those existing, whatever, flux generated, is it a vacuum in your, uh, on a given Calabriao, will be basically consistent with, <coughs> with that uh, inflationary value where you have the large field once it's there. So you can conservatively estimate an upper bound of the large field models by just counting the number of Calabiaus that allow for the project, uh, it is in the type 2b context here, that allow projecting in a two-form Raman-Tamon axiom, just as an example. This should be, you may be, may be able to do by scanning over the GLSMs of the, such a, uh, such a uh, you know, subclass of Calabria, that's, that's the Kreuzer Skarke classification. And then uh, you basically, you divide them, and you will basically, in the end, then get a result that depends on basically uh, how many, uh, is, a, is a ratio of the fraction of, or, uh, of how many flat-tuned saddle points, small field inflection points, you get from a random estimate versus how many, uh, what loss in Calabria numbers you have when you want to project in these axioms. And if you can calculate those things, may be uh, estimable, and then at least for that top corner, you may be able to get some estimate if those are parametrically different numbers, right? So this is basically the end of what I'm going to say. And uh, the, ar the argument I'm trying to make is, is that the, the influence of dynamics from the landscape of the tunneling uh, dynamics, internal inflation on that question is less worrisome than I would have expected. And it may be possible to get partial answers for regions to this question by really doing counting, by doing statistics. And if this can be done so successfully, I mean, it would be nice to know, right? I mean, you may have correlations that for a certain region that supports low energy supersymmetry, you get one or the other outcome of this counting question, of this ratio that I showed. And it would be m maybe nice to know this, given the, the coming experimental data. Thank you very much. Have the questions, Scott? The, um, <coughs> the initial value of the kinetic term of the scalar field typically depends on the thickness of the bubble wall and the location you tunnel to, right? The initial, yes. Uh, the initial value will, will vary depending on where you, where you come out, yeah. So it's the result that you get the zero value. That's a special choice where you're looking at the thin wall approximation, or? Um, I would have thought generically you would tunnel to arbitrary locations and you get arbitrarily initial kinetic terms. I guess that's the part I don't understand. <coughs> <coughs> You mean uh, arbitrary initial values of the field after tunneling, basically? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, but this, the, uh, yeah, yeah, but, but this was the, the point. I mean, we basically showed that regardless of the initial value of the field, in, uh, in the vast majority of cases, the field gets slowed down by the evolution, by, by the curvature inside the bubble, so much that you are tracking into uh, this. Yeah. No, I don't mean the initial, sorry, I don't yeah. mean the initial value of the field, I mean the initial value of phi dot. Well, that is for the common de Lucia, I think, the, the fact that the initial condition is set to zero, that phi dot is zero, I think that doesn't rely on the thin wall approximation as far as I know. But even if 
we actually looked at this. These solutions, if you give them finite speed, say on a quartic potential, this is an example I showed, if you give it some phi dot, it still tracks into zero speed on the on the. Is there, are you bounding it by like m Planck squared or something? Or uh, I'm asking because yeah. in, in general the small field had two problems, right? It was one that initial value of the field, but also the kinetic energy. Yeah, the, yeah. Before no, you enter the inflationary. No, 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 but but the the, the evolution <laughs> equation you get uh, under the dominance of initial dominance of curvature for let's say the quartic potential that leads you into this horizontal region of the inflection point for arbitrary phi dot. It can be bigger than m Planck. I don't care whether it's bigger than one m Planck unit or less. There, it will always track into zero speed. This is the property of the solution you get there. And this is true for, for everything, but just quartic, quintic, I mean, for every, for every higher power you have there. I have yeah. uh, two questions. One is that um, one of the organizers of the conference, uh, which is not me, <laughs> 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 yes. uh, wrote two articles uh, about uh, the difficulty to get a uh, large scale inflation, and in particular this action monogram and so on. Yes. Uh, uh, w what is your answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, diplomacy is not my, my strong, my strong strong. <laughs> how, <do I laughs> how do I answer to, the, to this? Uh, let's put it like this. Um, I mean, the question is, how do, how long, first, how long do you want the answer? I mean, the, I have already used up my time. <laughs> I'm missing for lunch. So long. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> for a short answer, I, I would say I have my doubts about uh, the results because they are, I'm not saying that what was put, the, the calculation, the, the, the one calculation, calculating the five brain interaction potential that uh, is supposed to give a strong, or I would argue to give a strong back reaction effect on the whole geometry. It may be that th such an effect can happen, but there are ways to actually, uh, if you want, warp this whole effect down. And then it doesn't affect the UV endpoint of the compactification. And then on the other end, the ca calculation was done in flat space. And we know <coughs> how difficult it is even to, to, to derive a, a classical warped effective field theory. We do not know how to do this calculation in warped space. And I, d I, d I have difficulty in actually uh, just directly using the flat space result and taking it over to the warp case and saying it presents the same, the same difficulty there. The other thing is that the physical reason behind or the physical argument that was made for this uh, one loop calculation was that because the charge of the five brain doesn't get warped down, charge just doesn't war don't warp, I agree with that, like you throw an electron in a black hole that uh, the argument was given. You'd see the charge of the black hole after that if you put a, a Gaussian surface around that, right? So to make, to make the Gauss law integral. Uh, the charges don't warp. But then, as far as I understand the argument, this was argued to be that because charges don't warp, you expect in the end a strong metric back reaction. But the metric perturbations are sourced by energy momentum. This is how I understand the Einstein equations. And energy momentum itself redshifts, even if the charge of the object doesn't redshift. Though I'm not sure whether uh, I would expect just from the fact that there is a, there's a force attached to the charge that I would necessarily get a strong back reaction on the geometry per se. I would have to do the full warp calculation to see that, and I don't know how to do it. I think the burden is on you. Hmm? you uh, the burden is on you. You are the one who has to show that. I know, I know. Yeah. The other thing, as I said, there is a way, even if the effect is there, if you set up, I mean, yeah, okay. Well, let me let, let me draw some diagram. Please, don't, please excuse me if it looks obscene. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is this a, a normal? Can I use this here, or is this? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> it looks like it looks like one for a whiteboard. That's why I'm not, I wasn't aware. <laughs> so, in the original setup for axion monodromy, what you had basically, oh, maybe I have to draw it bigger because otherwise. Uh, yes. Why are you doing this side? Maybe? Yeah, it's this side. <laughs> you want to send me for can, can, can you can you lift this here? This is no, 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 no. You got one minute. No, here, here. <laughs> you have some Calabiao which has a UV bulk. You uh, imagine you gender a geometry which has two floats, which basically directly mouth into the bulk. You enforce something like a geometry where you have two uh, two cycles that are connected by some, uh, if you want, like a we we'll call this a three chain, I guess, like a banana. The connection so that they are related in homology. Then you put five brains here, a five and an anti five brain to satisfy the five brain and also a potential three brain charge tadpole. And then you put a C2 axion on this here and minus C2 on here. You crank it on, you crack it up. And then, as I said, this was supposed to give you a linear potential. Now, the point is uh, 
so to speak, there is three way charge that is built up here, and that back direction will be accounted for in, in quite a lot of detail. Uh, and basically, this gives you bound in the field range. You cannot go arbitrarily far, but you can go from that point, from the three way charge argument, uh, far enough to get you like several tens of functions. Now, the calculation that was done in the paper you were referring to is, um, is basically uh, that the, the five brain charge also gives a force that stretches along these things, and uh, the calculation done in flat space. In, the, in, in, the, in, in, in this work, suggests that there is an effect coming from the UV region, which is so strong in back reacting the on the geometry that it screw up the whole thing basically. So let's assume this thing is there and it is as bad as, as, as it is claimed in, in, in this work. Then we basically already, for having better parametric control on the back reaction of the free brain charge, we had basically a follow up at the, uh, later where we basically assumed that. You don't set up this thing like this, but you first make a, a you know a, a single parent throat coming from the UV that's stabilized by you know sufficient amounts of free brain charge basically uh, down here, and then from there you branch off in your two throats where the five brains sit down here. Yeah? So and then the banana would reach like this. The point is now the UV scale of the effect would be the IR scale of that throat. It would never do anything here, and then by is arranging. <laughs> It is Baroque. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that these models are beautiful in the sense that they are elegant. <laughs> <laughs> but there's still an entropy problem, right? That's the second point of the criticism. That's more than quantum gravity. That yeah. That argument. Uh, I also uh, basically, as far as I understand the argument, this is a this is a parametric argument, and it is the weakest when you look for single field. Yes, I mean that, that applies more to so, single field. Yeah, exactly. And there, I would say the argument probably um, uh, uh, certainly it would, would imply. The entropy argument uh, from the other work would certainly imply that uh, that you cannot go to arbitrarily large field range. You probably would never get, given this argument, get large field eternal slow roll inflation by quantum diffusion at 500 Planck units out the on the potential. But that I already get from the free brain charge bound. It will never allow me to go that far. I would, you know, I would, b b uh, you know, boom bust the, the, the compactification before that. So uh, that may well be true. Uh, but uh, as I said, since we are interested in getting 60 e faults at the first point, this is, uh, uh, it, it does not run yet into that bound because it's a parametric bound. That's how I understand that. But as I said, for the other argument, even if this calculation gives this result that was claimed in, in, in the warp case and it has this bad effect, then there is a, uh, a setup where this can be easily warped down and brought under control. Yeah, easily in the sense that <laughs> <laughs> to the effect that warping uh, eases up things. I mean, in the sense that you get a reduction. How to set up such a geometry in a, a compact global model is difficult. I agree. I mean, this is, has not been uh, done, done so far. And uh, this is something that actually would be really nice. Actually, maybe the, the, these works with the, that have been done on these F-theory compactification that give these, these del petzos that are exchanged by orientally faults. This would be exactly the type of structure that, where, where the dual two cycle would be of that kind of type. So maybe actually this could be done. You could, one could look for this and then scan for H11 minus equal 2. That's what we need basically, models. Because you need two of these two cycles that each carry an axion connected in homology by scanning over these kind of models. Maybe this is possible. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.